Uh, good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Stuart McMillan, MSP. And before we begin, uh, members may notice that we have a, a large official delegation of Swedish visitors today. They're from uh, local authorities in Sweden, and uh, we would like to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament. Our first item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations and the role of the European Court of Justice and op options for dispute resolution post-Brexit. I would like to welcome our witnesses, Professor Sir David Edward, Michael Clancy, Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland, Laura Dunlop, QC, and Peter Seller of the Faculty of Advocates. Welcome and thank you for attending today. Uh, I'd like to invite Sir David to make some opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I, I th just a few points. The first is that uh, the basic uh, position paper on uh, dispute resolution is not perhaps as revealing as an earlier one on providing a cross-border civil judicial cooperation framework, because that contains what I think are two very important phrases. The first is the, the following principles should ensure orderly completion of ongoing cooperation so that Citizens, consumers, families and businesses involved in a dispute continue to have a clear, predictable legal framework for the resolution of that dispute. And second, legal certainty is maximised to the benefit of citizens and business by ensuring that their properly negotiated arrangements are respected. Now, that seems to me to be an absolutely admirable um, statement of what we're what we should be trying to achieve the second point i would make is that in dealing with the other countries you have to remember that for example in article 19 of the german basic law uh, it's provided should any person's rights be violated by public authority he may have recourse to the courts so as far as the Germans would be concerned, any dispute would need to be capable of judicial um, recourse. And the third point I'd make is this, that the uh, paper enforcement and dispute resolution appears to envisage that we're talking about disputes between the UK on the one hand and the EU on the other hand. But in fact, EU law is not really about that at all, and certainly the jurisdiction of the ECJ is not about that at all. And let me give you one simple example from my experience when I was a judge. A lady of Spanish nationality came to Britain and studied uh, picture conservation at Newcastle. She then went and had a, a job in the Louvre, I think, in Paris. And she then sought to be appointed to, be a, to a position in the Prado in Madrid. And she was refused consideration for that position because she did not have a picture conservation qualification in Spain. Now, uh, why, why did that qualification apply? Because the agreement between the Prado authorities and the Prado staff committee provided that you must have a Spanish qualification. So that was an agreement between the museum authorities and the, um, and the staff association about the qualifications needed to have a job in the Prado. 
so there you have a situation in which you have a Spanish national concerned with a, a, a wanting to be appointed to a job in Spain and refused it because, not because of a Spanish law, but because of an agreement between a state entity and its staff association. The, a great many of the cases that come before the ECJ from the national courts concern situations like that or comparable to that. And so one has to bear in mind that more than 50% of the case, the case load of the Court of Justice is concerned with cases arising in the national courts of the member states about the rights of individuals. And that is not going to go away in the event of uh, Brexit. Because, let me take examples, British companies will still want to be sending their employees <coughs> to other European countries as directors, managers, sales representatives, or technical staff. They will want to live in the country to which they're sent with their family, to send their children to school, and to have health care. Some of them will find themselves on the wrong side of local bureaucracy, and some of them will separate, and they will need to know which courts will grant a divorce, which will decide on the financial settlement, custody of children, and problems of cross-frontier access. That is what the jurisdiction of the ECJ is supposed or is designed to solve for ordinary people in ordinary day-to-day -day situations. It's not just trade disputes. And that, I think, is the most important point to understand in the whole of this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sir David. Uh, can I opening, uh, open by asking, uh, perhaps on the particular point that you raised, Sir David, uh, how will such disputes be resolved if the UK is not subject to the ECJ? Oh. How will such disputes be resolved if the UK is not subject to the European Court of Justice as the UK government has indicated that it's a red line for it? Well, somebody will have to resolve it. And the suggestion is that it would be solved by the British courts, but the British courts have to know what is the law that they are going to apply, and that is why there is this reference procedure to the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice says this is how you interpret the law. Now, it is true that under the EFTA procedures, the EFTA court would decide issues arising in the EFTA countries, but you have to remember that the EFTA the EEA agreement includes within it a huge part of EU law. So it's not, it, it's not the same as a situation where the UK leaves the single market and customs union, which is the hypothesis that we have to imagine, and somehow the British courts will decide on situations in, um, in arising in Britain. Correspondingly, the, um, if, if we're talking about a British person working in Germany, what is the law that the German courts will apply? Will they go to the European court to have a, a ruling on what the law is, or will there be some other authority which will tell them. Those are questions of extreme complication that are simply not properly addressed at all in the UK position paper. Thanks very much. I could ask the other members of the panel, you know, as I said, the ECG is said to be a red line issue for the UK, um, but for the general public, I, mean, I think it's the complexities of this matter are, are little understood. Um, is it possible to explain in plain language uh, for any non-lawyers who may be listening, what the relationship is between the ECJ and the single market and why the two are so inextricably linked. Uh, 
Well, one, one um, clear principle, I'm, I'll have a go and then others can join in. <laughs> one, um, I suppose, overarching principle is that there should be consistency. And the function of the ECJ is to um, ensure by giving opinions that the position that Sir David has sketched as an example would be resolved in the same way in different member states so that you don't have huge diversity of solutions to people encountering essentially the same difficulties. But others will have um, other views. Roughly speaking, I agree it's a question of, uh, I think the principal role of the Court of Justice of the European Union is to ensure uniform application of all the laws, all the regulations, etc., which are adopted by uh, the, the, the institutions in order to further the four freedoms, etc. Um, the role is to ensure that uniform application across the 28 member states, and it is the guardian of that. And um, I think that it's the interpretation and the application of that law which is important because, of course, um, uh, uh, many courts throughout the 28 might have different interpretations of the same point of law. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the ECJ is there to uh, uh, provide that certainty. Uh, and, of course, certainty is one of the things in this process which we are all uh, seeking for. Um, uh, Sir David mentioned that as one of the, one of the uh, points which people would want to, uh, to get out of the withdrawal process, and it's something which the Law Society has highlighted since we uh, began uh, commenting on the, uh, the referendum uh, and uh, when we put forward our proposals to the UK Government for inclusion in the negotiation, uh, that there should be certainty and stability uh, and that rights uh, of citizens should be respected. Uh, Professor Sir David Edward referred to the UK Government's uh, position paper on dispute resolution and uh, indicated that many questions are not being answered. I wondered if you would care to comment on the UK Government's position papers on these matters. I'll, I'll start off and then uh, others might uh, want to join in. I think it's because the, the, the purpose of the UK position paper is not to provide answers. It's to provide options. Um, and uh, th this is a, a range, a suite of potential choices which uh, could be arrived at. Um, but of course, uh, that could be arrived at uh, is where uh, the, the legal uh, issues uh, translate into political issues. Uh, and if one looks at uh, the, uh, the latest um, edition of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the joint technical note, uh, which summarises the UK and EU positions uh, as at, at the end of the third round, you can see there uh, that uh, there is significant difficulty um, in all of this. Uh, the red, yellow and green um, uh, um, colour scheme is, is quite uh, instructive if you hold it up and everyone can see it. You know, do you see, uh, you see green there? Um, uh, and green is uh, for uh, the use of EU law concepts. Uh, but when it comes to uh, whether uh, the Commission should monitor compliance uh, or um, uh, the, uh, whether the UK should be prepared to consider the establishment of an independent monitoring uh, arrangement, uh, that's a red uh, spot. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the, the mysterious uh, phraseology, which I think is, is interesting, is the role of the CJEU uh, is said to be for discussion in the governance group uh, and similarly uh, for future CJEU case law to be taken into account. Discussion in the governance group and the veil uh, of uh, lack of transparency, of obscurity, uh, falls on those two points. I don't underestimate how difficult uh, this is for the negotiating parties. I think you know, one of the things to be that's important is that, for example, in the year 2016, 25 references were made to the European Court by UK courts. And these are cases arising in the UK courts which, in one way or another, raise an issue of EU law. And it has to be recognised also that you don't always realise that there is an underlying question of EU law when a case starts. And that's going to be one of the problems about 
the cut-off period because um, it, it suggested, for example, that the, that the um, e ECJ will only have jurisdiction in cases that have already got there. But there are many cases in, in, in the womb of, of um, uh, litigation that may eventually be seen to arise, arise, arise a question of EU law about an existing situation before Brexit occurs. And that, that is a serious problem. I have a, I have a dispute with my employer about uh, the application of the equality law, gender equality, racial equality, or transfer of undertakings and so on. I have that dispute at the moment. It may not actually get to court until very nearly before March 2019. Is that dispute to somehow to descend into limbo because it hasn't got to the European Court in time? It, this is a much more complex situation than uh, the British government appears to recognize in that particular um, position paper, because as I say, that position paper seems to imply that all the disputes are going to be between the UK as a state and the EU, and they're not. Lord Dunlop. What I wanted to say about the pending cases point, and this is particularly directed to the position paper to which you've referred, convener, that Pending cases are generally dealt with. I mean, it's, it's a huge generalisation, but there is a kind of ma what I would call a mastermind principle. I've started, so I'll finish. So you don't change the way in which the case is going to be dealt with midway through. And to take a much more local example, when in Scotland the um, financial jurisdiction as between the Sheriff Court and the Court of Session was changed in the 2014 Act, Practicing lawyers would expect, and this is what's in the 2014 Act, that the provision that's made is that new cases are governed by the new rules. But what seems to be being canvassed in um, the position paper, and I'm looking particularly at uh, <coughs> paragraph 11, is something much more um, like a fudge, I suppose, and something that seems to at least raise the possibility of a discretion um, that there, there, can, there may be cases where considerable time and resources have been invested in CJEU proceedings. It may well be right that such cases continue to a CJEU decision. Practicing lawyers would, I think, expect that any case which is in a court will finish in that court. That would be the norm. So introducing what this appears to be suggesting, introducing a set of criteria according to which a decision is made as to whether this case in this court is to be allowed to continue in this court or not, is a very complicated exercise. Uh, and, and that is certainly something that, that struck me. The point Sir David is making is, is a further point, which is that there will be disputes which have not yet become cases. And there is a good argument for saying that those disputes should fall to be dealt with according to the law, which everyone understood to be the governing law at the time when the dispute developed. Um, now, the, the EU, in its position paper, is bidding for those cases to continue to go through the CJEU as well. And we, I think, as practicing lawyers, we understand why that is so. But there is a considerable gap between the two positions at the moment, um, with the UK saying, well, we will define, and there would be an awful lot of definition required, we will define what will pop, fall to be treated as a pending case. And the European Union saying um, disputes the facts of which have arisen under a particular regime should still go through the, the Court of Justice. That's a big gap. Did you want to come in? Just very briefly, it, it, it's not just theoretical, it's, it's um, a practical issue. I'm involved in three uh, Frankovich damages cases at the moment, which are in various phases, um, uh, they're assisted, so they're stayed in, in a couple of them. Um, but it could be the case that 
whenever exit day is designated for us, and yes, we can assume it's going to be March 2019, it could be sooner, if we haven't seized the court of the idea of sending a preliminary reference question to the Court of Justice, well, that remedy, that option could be uh, taken away if indeed uh, we only alighten it after uh, the fact, uh, after exit day. So the, the reality, it's, it's, a, it's a realistic uh, scenario. And I also, also pick up just one small point um, with regard to the position of the UK and the position of the EU on the red line of the, the CJU. Um, it seems to me that one needs to make a distinction between where rights of citizens will be adjudicated and trade disputes, etc. So other issues which arise under the, the withdrawal agreement. And we have quite a clear, I think quite a clear and simple position from the European Union, which has its political tensions, but nevertheless it's quite a clear one, whereas from the UK side we are yet to have any sense of clarity other than the red line. Thank you very much. We have two supplementaries, one from um, uh, Richard Lockhead and one from Mary Goujon. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Good morning. It's obviously quite a complex issue, and I just want to ask a relatively simple question, and that is that, on the one hand, Theresa May has said that exiting the European Union will mean that the European Court of Justice will have no jurisdiction over the UK. On the other hand, there's negotiations and a debate around what the post-Brexit relationship should be in relation to the single market, with some arguments that there should be membership of the single market and some arguments that there should be access to the single market. So my question is, is it possible, is it likely, that the UK would be able to negotiate access to the single market as they want? We'd prefer membership, they want access at the same time as which the European Court of Justice has no jurisdiction over the UK. And my second question is, is the UK likely... What supplementary is normally one okay. question, Mr well, Lockett? Relating to that, is, is, the UK likely to is the EU likely to insist that the, the ECJ has ongoing jurisdiction? Well, first point about that is it's entirely wrong to think that the, EU, the, the CGAU has jurisdiction in the United Kingdom. It, has sim it simply has jurisdiction to answer questions put to it by UK courts. If, and that may say that the existing e UK law is, has to be changed, but that's a quite different thing from saying that it has jurisdiction in the UK in the same way as the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has jurisdiction in Scotland. That's the first point. Secondly, on the single market, to go back to layman's language, what we're talking about is the level playing field. And if, the, if we want to play on the same playing fields as the other 27 as regards the single market, they can legitimately say, well, we want to play by the same rules and we want to have a single referee who's going to tell us what those rules are. And it, it, the, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bizarre kind of wish dream wish that we can be, have play on this playing field on equal terms, but have our own referee. It's just absurd. Um, Mary Cushon. Uh, thank you. I mean, it was uh, preparing for this meeting, you can see how complex, you had an idea that it was a very complex situation, but I think hearing some of your examples and some of the points you've raised, you realise exactly how much more complex <laughs> this, this situation is. And I really just wanted to ask, I mean, a point raised by Laura Dunlop, and you talked about, you know, there's quite a big uh, a gap there. Um, do you think it's going to be possible to bridge the gap between the two positions in the time that there is uh, for the negotiations? Um, yeah, and just get your, each of your responses to that. Well, on that particular point, I was, I admit, slightly dismayed by the suggestion in the UK paper that there's going to be a lot of definition going on. If you're going to start trying to agree complex definitions of what is or is not a pending case and putting in factors that you have to take into account, like how much time and expense has already been spent in the case and that sort of thing, that is going to take up 
a great deal of time. My suspicion, and others may disagree, is that the compromise position as far as pending cases are concerned is something around um, cases which are already uh, with the registrar in Luxembourg, something like that, will be allowed to proceed. That would be a clear rule. Um, and a casualty of that would be the sort of disputes we were describing earlier, where the dispute is there, but the, the litigation is not. So th these would be clear rules, although they, um, the consequences of that is that you are denying the people involved in those disputes a resolution according to the legal framework that, that ordinarily would govern that dispute. So to answer your question, it depends. That probably is the answer to every question. It depends. But if, if we get sidetracked into a very convoluted um, drafting exercise of trying to define criteria for things that actually practicing lawyers can all recognize, like pending cases, then there isn't enough time, I don't think. Um, yeah. 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 Um, just further to. Clancy wanted to come in. Uh, it, ju just, uh, just a, a short word, convener. Um, I think um, the average case time in the ECJ is uh, 15 months or thereabouts, um, uh, and it, it was probably quicker when you were in charge, David. Um, Not <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but 15 months is is uh, uh, you know what have we got at the moment? We, we've got. Uh, uh, something approaching just uh, just over uh, 18 months. Uh, and uh, so therefore you can see that if there were a reference today from a court, it might be able to be determined prior to the exit day as we imagine it, but we don't even yet know what the exit day is going to be, and the bill could provide different exit days for different purposes. Uh, so therefore, um, it, it may be the case that there's a sliding scale in some form of transitional arrangement uh, which could take us beyond the 29th of March to deal with uh, cases which are commenced uh, with the understanding of a certain uh, set of uh, legal parameters. Um, uh, but I, I think the, the issue of pending cases is such that um, we have to remember uh, that under the Human Rights Act, uh, there is no... Uh, um, uh, right to an effective remedy, because Article 13 of ECHR is disapplied by the Human Rights Act. Uh, so uh, even though uh, you may have a good case um, uh, in, in terms of EU law, uh, the, uh, you can't effectively claim that the Human Rights Act could be paid in aid there. But let's say your case in EU law relates to some aspect of property such as intellectual property or something like that. Uh, if you are then deprived of your right of property because uh, the government has chosen a particular date uh, for exit, uh, at which point CJEU uh, uh, access is denied, then that puts the government in a difficult position. Uh, and a difficult position which can be... Um, uh, taken in the national courts. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Um, if the Prime Minister doesn't announce a transition in her Florence speech next week, then I think everything you've said is right. But uh, what most would expect is that there will be an, a, a UK application for transition period. And therefore, is it not the case that all these pending cases you're describing today will actually flow into that transition period? We don't know how long that's going to be, but the Chancellor gave evidence to the Treasury Select Committee this week in which he argued quite clearly for a longer transition period. In those circumstances, Michael Clancy's point about 15 months goes on and on and on. So is, not the case, is it not more of an argument about how many more cases are initiated which could go to the European Court of Justice over the next 18 months before we formally leave on the 30th, 29th of March 2019? Is that not the issue? And then how long the transition period is? But it depends, doesn't it, on what your transition agreement is. But I'm assuming it has to include the ECJ continuing to have jurisdiction in the way in which you well, just described. Well, uh, yes, the ECJ, does it have a British judge? Uh, it, are British lawyers entitled to appear before the, the court? Is the United Kingdom what is called a pri privileged applicant, in able to, to appear in any case before the ECJ 
to argue the UK position. These things will have to be worked out. Sure. And simply using a vague expression like transitional period, what you're really talking about is a kind of standstill, a continued standstill. Well, what are we leaving if this, if this standstill is in place? What, do, what does we are leaving the EU on the t on, in March 2019, what does that expression actually mean? And I think one of the greatest difficulties about this discussion is the use of vague phraseology, which needs to be tied down in very precise legal terms. And that takes a long time to negotiate. And remember that March 2019 is the last point, but you've still got to get round the parliaments of 27 uh, member states and uh, the European Parliament before you even enter upon this. The other, the other issue is, of course, that um, uh, what examples can we bring to the table uh, of uh, long transitional periods uh, where one court has uh, left the jurisdiction of another, uh, or one, one uh, country has left the jurisdiction of a court, rather. Uh, and uh, in the paper which we uh, sent to both the UK government and uh, the uh, Task Force 50, um, uh, we explained that um, uh, the, the situation in New Zealand, uh, when New Zealand gave up its jurisdiction uh, to, uh, 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 of having cases go to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, um, it, it did that in 2003. When I spoke to the, uh, the previous registrar of the Supreme Court um, a couple of years ago, she estimated at that point uh, that there could be as many as 40 cases still sculling around in New Zealand which might end up uh, at the JCPC uh, in London. So that gives you an idea of how long a tail this could have, because 2003 to the present day is 14 years. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, that, if that is the case, that would test um, uh, the political will of Michel Barnier uh, and also the political will of Theresa May and their successors and their successors. Lewis MacDonald. Thanks very much. And, and on that transitional point, one of the questions that's been put uh, uh, to uh, uh, this committee and to others is a transitional pr period that involves as Sir David described, remaining uh, with jurisdiction of the European courts, remaining uh, within the single market and remaining within the customs union for a transitional period, uh, a transitional period to be defined. But that possibility uh, has certainly been uh, uh, tabled. What would be the implications of that in terms of uh, case, case law and in terms of uh, the management of case law? And also, if the... United Kingdom was to withdraw from the European Union, from the political institutions in March 2019, but to remain within the single market for a further two or three years, uh, would that then uh, require the uh, establishment of a new form of arbitration? Would it uh, permit the jurisdiction of the EFTA court or something like the EFTA court, or would it require uh, the the, the status quo, as I think Sir David described it, of, of, of not leaving that jurisdiction during such a transitional period. To say remain within the single market means being, uh, being um, within the market, playing according to the rules of that market as they are at the time. So does it mean that you are remaining within the single market on the basis of the rules as they existed at the moment when f supposed exit occurs at the beginning of the transitional period, or are, are the rules to be the rules as they uh, are developed in the course of the transitional period? And is the United Kingdom to have any say in the formulation of rules emerging during that period? Is it to be part of the legislative procedure? Is the Court of Justice to have jurisdiction? Um, what is then to happen about cases which arise in the course of the transitional period? 
<coughs> these, these are not hypothetical questions. If we're going to go down that road, we need to be very precise. And part of the difficulty is that it's, the, the UK is presenting a wish list, but entirely forgetting that the others may have their own wish list or their own objections, as, for example, as I said, the Germans will object to any situation in which an individual does not have a right of recourse to a court. And, if I may, and let Laura, um, um, uh, what are the known knowns here? The known known is that uh, uh, Clause 1 uh, of the, uh, the uh, European Union Withdrawal Bill says the European Communities Act 1972 is repealed on exit day. Uh, and uh, Section 3 of that is the section which um, it subordinates national courts to the CJEU. So if there is no uh, national legal order uh, in all of this, it becomes intensely difficult to then uh, muse about what what might be or what might uh, have been if we uh, uh, are sitting at some time in the future. And when one looks then at Clause 6, um, uh, it tells us that uh, our court or tribunal, which I think is, is not actually defined in the bill, but... but uh, uh, there, there we are. That's, uh, that's another amendment which we're going to have to try. Um, uh, but uh, a court or tribunal uh, is not bound by any of the principles laid down uh, or uh, cannot refer uh, any matter to uh, the uh, European court on or after exit day. Uh, so, in a sense, is what is the negotiation? What is the agenda on the negotiation? Do we look at the bill as some kind of statement of this is our uh, our set of cards on the table from the UK government's perspective, uh, or is it uh, the, uh, the sort of um, uh, rather more um, uh, ill-defined uh, proposals <coughs> in, the, in the proposal papers uh, when we know that, that uh, there is this gulf, a great gulf, between uh, the positions currently uh, of the UK government and the uh, EU? Can I just say, I think it is initially attractive to see a transitional period as a very big part of the solution to some of these difficulties. I think it's psychologically appealing to imagine a gradual slope so the influence, say, of the European Court of Justice would decline slowly and gradually and we'd all be able to adjust. But without using emotive language about cliff edges and so on, I think it's probably not possible to do even this part, which is dealing with the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice without some step changes. There are going to have to be some situations in which you could do something yesterday and you can't do it today. There are going to have to be dates like that. Um, and and that's, this is a very small part of all the many negotiations that have to take place and the many arrangements that have to be made. I was just going to make one um, point, which is a transitional deal um, says to me that the the deal that we will have to have have negotiated by this time in one year um, will have a period over which we transition. And if that's the scenario, then then I don't really have anything else to add. On the other hand, if it is a transitional deal where we're basically saying we want a lot more time to be able to get through these nitty-gritty details, then we will need the unanimous consent of all the other member states, as Article 50 requires. Those are two different beasts. But as, as far as I understand transitional deal, it is that we have to have negotiated everything in that two-year time frame to allow European Parliament and perhaps national parliaments to have their say as well. Uh, and then we have some sort of transition, which again is a little bit of a vague concept on perhaps someone's wish list, because I don't understand what it is. One possibility is that the 30th of March 2019 marks a political uh, point of departure, a clear uh, day, date, as, as Laura described it, where we cease to be members of the European Union. But it is conceivable that if the will was there and if the bill before the House Commons currently was amended in the right way, that that that, that could be confined to a political uh, separation at that point, and that the other points processes of separation could follow over a two or three year period, and that perhaps might be relevant to the point. Yes. 
you've just made. Uh, and that's a political um, negotiation, political uh, settlement at the end of the day. But of course, going back to the question, but staying in the single market and staying mm. in the customs union, uh, if the CJU comes down with a decision on a reclassification of a product which is flown in from the United States and lands in uh, London or comes to Paris, well, are we beholden to that in that transitional uh, period afterwards? The answer to that, in my opinion, is absolutely yes, we'd have to be, but we wouldn't have the political say over it yeah. because we go back to the question about whether or not we would have the judge, the advocate general, etc. Yeah. I, I Sorry. Well, even before you, you get to that stage, let's assume that something like the BSE scare arises in the course of the transitional period and regulations have to be made for the uh, confinement of um, tra traffic of, of animals or something of that nature. And these regulations have to be made tomorrow. Is the UK to be there? Is the UK expert, are the UK experts to be part of the committee that decides? What, what place does the UK have, not just in the judicial um, evolution of the single market, but in the political and administrative evolution of the single market? If you say, well, we're out politically, but in legally, what about these situations which can blow up quite quickly? That, that's, that's why the second part of my initial yeah. question referred to the EFTA court, because clearly the countries which are in the European economic area and not members of the European Union, like Norway, for example, are in a position where they have to apply the law uh, as defined in, Europe, in the European Union. But the supervision of that is in the hands of the EFTA court rather than the ECJ, uh, and they are not political members and have no political say in those decisions. Extensive political, uh, in the background, mm, sure. extensive political involvement in the evolution of EU law, which, is, which they are then obliged to transpose into domestic law, but they are, they are represented on many committees they have a political input into the creation of EU law, which they are then going to have to apply themselves. And that essentially was my question. Is that in any sense a model that the United Kingdom could apply? I would, I would say it certainly is a model, but you have to know what the model, is, what the model contains. And if, you, if what you're saying is, well, we don't want, we don't want to be ruled by Brussels anymore, well, what, are you saying that, well, we're outside this altogether? Are we going to participate? In what way are we going to participate? You know, it, remember that the uh, EFTA, the EEA agreement, is thought by, particularly in Norway, to be a rather unsatisfactory agreement from their point of view and there are considerable difficulties in the process of transposition of EU law into Norwegian law. Um, so uh, I don't know that that, that is, a, that is a, an attractive example, but it's an example applying to Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, of which only Norway is, in any sense, a major player. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on in order to get other members' uh, questions in. Can I move to Jackson Carlo? Thank you, you Right, OK. Uh, Ross Greer. Thanks. Um, come here. I'd like to move on to a point um, in relation to the trade agreement with Canada, but just very briefly before that, what would happen in the event of there being no deal reached? Taking aside the serious economic consequences, etc., what would the implications for uh, <coughs> disputes be if we get to Brexit Day and there isn't a deal to be ratified, but we have left. Uh, I, I, let me begin, and, and uh, anyone who wants to chip in. Um, the, the supranational relationship which we have with, uh, with Europe uh, will, will cease to apply because Article 50 uh, says that uh, you get to the end of the two years, uh, and if there is no agreement, the treaties cease to apply. 
Uh, so therefore, uh, that supranational relationship which we currently enjoy uh, is one which then becomes uh, one of public international law. I think I'm right in saying that. Uh, and if it's public international law, then there's a cascade of various uh, uh, arrangements, uh, all of which would have to be done in a scurry and a hurry. Um, uh, uh, because um, uh, things like uh, the WTO uh, arbitration uh, arrangements uh, or the law of the sea uh, uh, issues uh, or, um, uh, or other things in connection with um, all the various types of, of uh, arrangement which you could imagine, uh, as well as, uh, apart from the trade elements, setting up um, uh, bilateral agreements uh, uh, or multilateral agreements with EU member states uh, to deal with things like um, uh, family matters or something like that. Signing up to the Lugano Convention um, uh, would be one, uh, one clear uh, issue which would have to be dealt with. Uh, but all of that takes time. Uh, so there would be um, some, some, uh, some difficult sleepless nights um, uh, but, as Sir David has pointed out in the past, um, uh, there are instances where if the uh, <coughs> heads of government manage to get round a table and agree something, uh, they can then register that agreement, um, uh, even though it is not a formally approved treaty, they can register that agreement with the UN and then uh, try to hold to it. And that was, try uh, that was uh, employed um, after uh, Maastricht? In, uh, in 92, uh, and uh, also Den 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 uh, Den Denmark, yes, uh, and also David Cameron attempted to, to do exactly the same thing and did do the same thing um, uh, in a substantive, sub suspensive way um, uh, when he negotiated the, uh, the attempt to, uh, to modify uh, the treaties and their application to the UK before uh, the, the referendum. I think it's very important to understand just what the WTO does and what it does not do. Under the WTO agreement, it, you have certain rules. You cannot apply a more favourable tariff to one country than to anybody else. And the exception is a customs union. Now, assuming we drop out the cliff edge, we go over the cliff edge, we are no longer in the customs union, and therefore, formally speaking, the EU has to apply to the United Kingdom the same rules as they apply to anybody else as regards tariffs. But, uh, and tariffs, customs procedures are important for the, not for the general trade in goods, but most particularly for the passage of components crossing the, um, crossing the frontier several times in the case of building motor cars, for example. And then there are very complicated rules of origin which apply, which, which are eliminated by the EU Customs Union. And then you're only talking about goods. In particular, you're not talking about services, which is the most important element. In the, in the UK economy. And um, the, the, there, is, there is very little in the WTO agreements. There is a thing called TRIPS and uh, GATS, which are about trade and services, but it's very limited. So you'd suddenly have a situation in which there are no rules, except perhaps on a very limited area. And I think that's the, that's the most important thing to realise about the cliff edge scenario. Thank you. And, oh, sorry, Peter. And on the WTO side of things, when, when um, you're selling your goods and it gets stopped at the border, so from between Dover and Calais, and it gets stopped for the uh, X number of time and it's costing you a lot of money, what can you do about it as a, as a company or as a person? under WTO rules, not very much other than lobby your government as much as you can, raise it as a political point, and hopefully they will take it through the dispute settlement process. Uh, 
and you're on the, on the outside of that as an individual. So in terms of being able to assert your rights, etc., in a court, you don't really have that if the fallback is WTO, WTO rules. But that's the trade stuff. If we're talking about citizen rights as well, and how what happens to the citizens afterwards, um, from what I understand with the repeal bill uh, in its current form, all the regulations, all the decisions, all the directives that are in place with regard to uh, EU citizens' rights here and UK citizen, citizen rights um, uh, in, in the EU, they would be grandfathered through. So they would still be the rights in play in, and you can assert them in court, albeit just here, not uh, before the European Court of Justice. Whether they would change is a different matter. Thanks very much. And on a somewhat more positive note than uh, falling off the, the cliff edge, um, I'm wondering the comprehensive economic uh, trade agreement with Canada, the, the mechanisms it's got, how comparable are they to what the UK government seems to be seeking? It seems in some aspects of, of their rhetoric and some aspects of the position papers that CETA is comparable, the mechanisms included in CETA are somewhat comparable to what they are aiming for. Is that the case? Well, it's true as far as trade is concerned. Mm. But you're, you're saying nothing about the case, the, the, the citizens' rights, workers' rights. You're saying nothing about the situation of poor Mrs. Bobadilla, who qualified in, in picture restoration in Britain and wanted to, to do picture restoration in the Prado. It says nothing about that. And that is what the vast majority of the case law of the Court of Justice is about. Thank you. I think, it, I think it might be helpful, actually, and to get on record um, these alternative arbitration mechanisms that, uh, that there's talk of falling back on. It's not just uh, with Canada. I believe there's one to do with the association agreement that the EU has with the Ukraine, for example. I don't think these are widely understood, so I don't know if for the benefit of, uh, again, for the benefit of the non-lawyers, if, if someone could just explain them. I've got some experience, not a great deal, of international investment arbitration. It, it, it is extremely time-consuming, and it is, in general, extremely slow. It is not wide... There are a lot of complaints about it, and um, some, <laughs> some countries have withdrawn from the... Uh, what is called the ICSID system for settlement of investments disputes. I wouldn't recommend it if, if I were talking to an individual citizen. I wouldn't recommend it as a means of settling their disputes. First of all, you've got to choose your arbitrators. They've got to have the backup. Um, many of the arbitrators in investment arbitration have their own offices and their own assistants, I don't, but uh, they do. Uh, let's, 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 let's think of the 25 cases which, were, which went from the UK courts to the Court of Justice. It's not a matter of convening um, an ad hoc arbitration tribunal. They've got to have backup, they've got to have staff, the, EFTA court has three full-time judges and a permanent staff of 20, and that does not include translators. If, if uh, the uh, president's um, principal assistant in the EFTA court said if UK were to join, they would have to increase their permanent staff to 50. So it's, this, is, this, this is fanciful for me. Laura Dunlop. I'm not going to live to regret this, but we are wondering if we could have a shot at some kind of list <laughs> that we could pass to you, you know, in answer to your question about what are the bespoke mechanisms that are out there. I think we are largely talking about trade disputes and disputes under trading agreements. Um, if, if I'm right about that, we could, I think, do a bit of research on that and try to produce some summary of ones we've been able to identify. 
Yeah. I don't but know I'm, if that would assist. I'm sure, I'm sure members would find that very helpful. But j just before moving on to the, the next member's question, my understanding is that many of these um, arbitration uh, panels of judges co convene behind closed doors and it's a lot less transparency than if something goes to a properly constituted court like the ECJ. In the, in the um, investment arbitrations, the parties, which are normally a corporation and a, and a government, they can say whether they want any part of it to be revealed. But the, um, pr the proceedings before the uh, award are in private. Okay. Thank and you it very can much. Be kept uh, confidential. Right. Thank you, uh, Mary Cushon. I am. Oh, just <laughs> I think we could spend an awful lot uh, more time on this as well. Um, but I did have some questions. It was about the the withdrawal bill in particular. Um, and also, well, actually, before we get to that, we've talked about some of the position papers. Now, we've mentioned, brought this up in the committee before as an issue where some of the positions that have been put forward relate to matters that are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And it'd be interesting to get a legal perspective on if the negotiations are based on some of those position papers, like I say, that relate to specifically devolved issues. What will happen to that should an agreement eventually be reached and if it's done on the basis of what is in those papers? And what does that mean for Scotland? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm being nominated. <laughs> very good. Um, uh, well, um, uh, you pose a very interesting question. Um, uh, as you know, um, uh, uh, international uh, agreements, brackets, including the EU, uh, are reserved to the United Kingdom under uh, Schedule 5, Paragraph 7 uh, of the Scotland Act 1998. Uh, so, therefore, uh, formally, in terms of the agreement, um, uh, the, uh, the Scottish Parliament, uh, it is out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament uh, uh, and uh, the, the Scottish Government uh, to uh, uh, be part of that discussion. Um, uh, and I think that, that uh, this is where um, uh, we, uh, we, we, may, uh, we may reflect on parts of the bill uh, which uh, talk about uh, things which uh, are uh, out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament, um, uh, and in particular, uh, what happens under Clause 11. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if we, we want to get into that particular thicket uh, today, um, uh, because it is, it is um, uh, problematic, at the very least, uh, and uh, I, I think there are and there are a number of options which uh, we uh, have put forward. I th hope you've seen our uh, memorandum of comments uh, on the bill, uh, and those options uh, uh, apply to uh, these provisions in uh, 11.1b, uh, uh, which is the new subsection uh, 4ab uh, and c inserted into uh, uh, section 29. So, in the Final analysis, the, the issue of, of the politics comes into play uh, and the role of intergovernmental relationships in this is a key one. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the role of the JMC uh, and the participation in the JMC uh, is one where uh, the, uh, the Scottish Government uh, can uh, make its, its points most cogently. Uh, and the question is uh, how... Um, how can we encourage the JMC to be um, uh, the, the kind of organisation which um, is one which everyone can stand back at, uh, from and say uh, this, is, this is a functioning uh, organisation? Now, I know that, that uh, there is an up-and-coming meeting of the JMC, so um, uh, it will be for um, the UK ministers and Scottish ministers following that JMC to express their satisfaction with the process there. Can I just... One thing you need to think about, I think, also, is the position of the Scottish legal system and the Scottish judicial system and the Scottish prosecution system in the mechanism of what are called JHA, um, the uh, Europol, Eurojust, the European Arrest Warrant, um, the enormous number of... Uh, 
cross-border uh, cross um, information systems, the, um, what we've already touched upon, which is, is the um, various conventions and regulations about recognition and enforcement of judgments. That is directly uh, Scottish competence. And uh, I think Scotland has an uh, absolute, absolute right to know what is going on and to have its own say on it. I would just ask, um, in terms of that, I mean, you raised Europol and, and some of the cross-border issues. Does the, do you think that the withdrawal bill, as it stands at the moment, would give uh, that, that Scotland has sufficient protection with that, within that in terms of continuing to tackle cross-border no. cross crime? No. OK. But would you see that as an attack on the Scottish legal system? No, um, it's, it's because it's put together by people who don't know that, that, is, that, that these problems exist. As somebody described it, this, somebody described that as an undergraduate essay which would have failed. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, the UK position paper you're referring to? <laughs> yes. On enforcement and dispute yes. resolution. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, Rachel uh, Hamilton. It's just actually a point that I'm interested in about the position papers, because obviously there's a lot of um, flesh to be put on the bones of the position papers. Do you think that it's that that's deliberate because of the negotiating position that, that the UK government are in, and neither side want to give too much away? From what I hear, that part of the difficulty is that the people who are writing these position papers and the people who are negotiating don't want to hear from the experts. I know of a number of people who have offered help and been refused. The other, sorry, no, a few more. Well, I was just going to say, there are, of course, the position papers and the partnership papers. Okay. And the partnership papers um, in some instances are an attempt to dis disrupt the sequencing plan, so to take the current negotiations beyond the three issues with which they're supposed to be concerned and only concerned. In other words, to try to head, if possible, in the direction of um, what the position is to be about trade. And I have seen some arguments that it is necessary to do that, for example, resolving the position about Northern Ireland would be assisted by knowing what some of the answers are on questions about the single market and the customs union. So I think there are attempts going on to persuade the EU negotiators to enter into discussion of some issues which more properly belong in the next phase of negotiations once the three first primary issues have been resolved. Um, one of the things which I think is striking as you are um, reading a lot of this material is that questions of dispute resolution really belong with the ultimate solution for trade. You know, what is to happen about mm -hmm. trade and provision of services and so on. Once we know that, dispute resolution may become easier to resolve. Trying to do it at the moment, which is certainly the case in the partnership paper, um, is, there is an element of cart before horse about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Peter Seller, did you want to come no, in there? Okay. No. Okay. Um, we've now come to the end of the session. It's been a, a fascinating session and there's probably m much more ground that we could cover. If I was about to ask Mr Clancy if there were any other points that you would wish to make and ground that we you felt we hadn't covered. Um, we, we've, we've discussed a lot about the CJAU as we classically understand it in the, the terms of, of uh, uh, the dealing with references and, and uh, citizens' issues and, and, uh, and trade matters. Uh, but I wanted to draw attention to two uh, specific points. One is, uh, one is the, the issue of the role of the CJEU in Euratom uh, and uh, the way in which uh, uh, the adherence uh, of uh, CJEU uh, in uh, that, that treaty is uh, effectively the reason for withdrawing from Euratom. Uh, and I think that that's, that's problematic on a number of, 
of p points, not only in terms of civil nuclear uh, usage, but also medical uh, nuclear, uh, um, uh, nuclear medicine, <coughs> uh, and uh, the difficulties which are going to be created uh, if we do not have a, a, a single market for uh, the, the uh, import and export uh, of radioisotopes and things like that in terms of health, uh, as well as the more strategic issues around about uh, civil nuclear matters. And the, the, uh, the second uh, point is about uh, the, uh, the Unified Patent Court Agreement, uh, which uh, again is, is another uh, uh, treaty um, agreement where, where amongst the EU member states uh, for um, uh, there to be such a, a body. Uh, and of course, the UK uh, has uh, a, a, a branch, a chamber of that court, uh, which uh, will be situated in London. But again, uh, the, uh, in fact, I think the, the Parliament is going to be asked to ratify uh, the, the agreement. I think there may indeed be an order uh, sculling around at the moment. Um, uh, for the ratification of that agreement. And uh, so we've got to be, uh, although it is in difficulties in Germany, I believe, at the moment, um, uh, the, uh, the point is that uh, it is not a court uh, in, in terms of a court or tribunal uh, under Clause 6, because it's actually a separate international body. Uh, but it's uh, again the uh, the impact of CJEU in it means that it is effectively daubed uh, with um, a, 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 a sign which says uh, we don't want this either. And I think we've got to be uh, careful um, about uh, simply uh, identifying the initial CJEU. I think the UK government. It should be careful about identifying those initials uh, and simply saying that's something we don't want under any circumstances. I think uh, we've got to be, uh, be much more circumspect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I thank our witnesses uh, for coming today and I shall briefly suspend uh, the committee. I'm going to private session. Thank you.